It is now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks so much, uh, thanks so much Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question this morning is to the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier why he had failed to act on expert uh, advice to protect seniors in long-term care in the midst of a second wave of COVID-19. He refused to answer, but the Minister of Long-Term Care insisted that action was already underway and that concerns about infection control and staffing levels were simply politicking. Will the Premier and the Minister, in fact, stand in their places today and uh, repeat this claim? To reply on behalf of the government. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for that. Uh, absolutely, I will repeat that. And I'll tell you why. Because our ministry, this government, has absolutely been dedicated to addressing the issues in long-term care from the very beginning. We have had IPAC teams available to our long-term care homes, and that continues. We have had staffing issues and had an expert panel uh, to advise on a comprehensive staffing strategy. It is, it is well known that preceding COVID, the staffing was in a crisis in long-term care homes. And we pulled out every stop, including four uh, regulation amendments, three emergency orders, uh, making sure that our homes had the flexibility to provide the staffing that's necessary and that they have the duty to provide. That is absolutely clear, and I will repeat it again. Uh, there is politicking going on on this issue, and uh, our IPAC teams are in our two homes that are affected in, in uh, Ottawa, the West End Villa. And I will repeat Spons? that 99 per cent of our long-term care homes have no resident cases, 99 per cent, and our attention is on the ones who are affected severely. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I'm nothing short of shocked by this minister's response because just after she made those comments yesterday, she received this very letter, uh, which in fact has something different to say about what's happening in long-term care. That goes to the Minister of Long-Term Care, please, Lawrence, and thank you. Um, the letter represent is is a letter that um, is you know penned by associations that represent literally every long-term care home in this province. It's a letter that's representative of uh, organizations that represent thousands and thousands of families who have loved ones in long-term care. And that letter says, and I quote, we need to say plainly and directly that the government of Ontario has not yet put the necessary supports and preventative measures into place that we in the sector have long made clear are essential to protecting our residents and staff. Now, if there is a plan in place to protect long-term care homes and, uh, during a second wave, as the government claims is the case, why are the people who run those homes and the families of people who live in those homes insisting that the opposite is in fact true? Minister of Long-Term Care, thank you, please Speaker. take your seat. And, and thank you for the, uh, the question once again. Uh, it does not take a letter from agencies or the OLTCA to provide us information to act on. We've been acting. We have been absolutely on this from the beginning. You don't just snap your fingers and make staffing appear. That's why we started as soon as we had the Justice Scalise report in July. We started organizing an expert panel to give us proper information, to consult with the sector, consult with our agencies. We have been doing this all along. You simply show your ignorance when you think that you can just snap Order. your fingers, snap your fingers and create, create staff. We have been absolutely dedicated to making Response. sure we're addressing staffing and infection control, making sure that our homes have support. Yeah. Now, stop the clock. I'm going to caution the member, the Minister of Long-Term Care, on her language and to ensure that it is uh, temperate and appropriate for the legislature. Start the clock. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, I'm really shocked by this minister. I mean, this is willful ignorance on the part of the government to ignore exactly what it is. <laughs> Just caution one member for that uh, very word. I'm going to caution the Leader of the Opposition for that very word. Please make your language temperate. 
But it is a matter of life and death, Speaker. The government is doubling down on their lack of action, and yet it is a, it is a matter of life and death for the people who are living in long-term care. Eleven people have died at West End Villa in Ottawa. The, just this month, 11 people have died. And this letter makes it very clear, regardless of whether the Premier and the Minister wish to ignore it, the letter makes it clear that things will get worse if this Ford government does not act on this issue, if they continue to deny that the problem exists. Question. The letter says, Ontario's long-term care homes are not currently ready to manage a second wave of COVID-19. So why is the government refusing to follow the advice of providers, of experts, Thank you. of residents, of families? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. As a family physician for almost 30 years, I understand life and death. And I, my heart goes out to everyone who's been impacted by COVID-19. Our government is dedicated and on the ground, knowing what's happening with our inspectors in these homes, working with uh, public health, uh, Ottawa Public Health, to make sure that we do every measure possible, making sure that our hospitals are involved. But I, I want to mention, we're not only working on the emergency processes, we're also stabilizing the sector. We're also looking at a, a modernization of the sector that was so badly neglected. And I'm going to repeat, 21 homes out of 29 in outbreak have no resident cases. 21 out of 29 have no resident cases. 99% of our homes Response. have no resident cases. We are making sure that the homes that need support are getting it, and the hospital sector is assisting. We are taking the concerns of our sector and the representative organization. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but it sounds like another invisible uh, uh, iron a ring of uh, iron, or whatever you used to call it, because it obviously iron ring around long-term care. Another invisible one, Speaker. You know, three months ago, three months ago, infection control experts urged this government, urged them to build out proper infection uh, and, pre uh, and prevention and uh, uh, and control measures inside of our long-term care facilities. Now, families of residents and the homes themselves speaker the homes themselves are pleading with the government for action and in this letter they say quote we need immediate action to ensure the health and safety of our residents hard working staff and family members this was written yesterday speaker experts provided a blueprint for exactly that kind of action months ago why has the premier failed to act premier to reply no Pre, Mr. Speaker, I, I have to sit back. And the leader of the opposition is invisible, talking about invisible. The only person that's been invisible is the leader of the opposition. It's been invisible by Casper the Ghost for the last six months. And for the leader of the opposition to stand up like an armchair quarterback, Monday morning quarterback, and tell us how the game's been go going, when our, my great minister, both ministers here, have been working around the clock doing everything we possibly can with the infectious control procedures. They're in place. We're moving on it. Everything's moving all at once, Mr. Speaker. But I, I can tell you, I have 100 percent confidence in the system. As the minister said, 99 percent of the homes are case-free. And we're going to work on making sure it's 100 percent, as it was just a few weeks ago. Response? But for, for the leader of the opposition to come in and, and start uh, saying like she knows everything is just the goal, the goal of her is staggering, absolutely staggering. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Sticks and stones, Speaker. But who I listen to is the experts and the providers and the family members and the residents who are all saying exactly what I'm saying. So I don't know where the Premier gets his information from, but certainly we're listening to the people that really matter. When our armed forces actually blew the whistle on what was happening in long-term care homes Order. under this Ford government, the Premier said he promised it would never happen again. But Ontario's long-term care homes are not ready. That's not me saying that. They are telling the minister and the premier that they are not ready for the second wave. They're saying they don't have the staff that they need. They are saying that they don't have the infection controls in place that are necessary. 
The Premier has had months to prepare, and so has this minister. So my question is, why is it that they are feeling so unprepared? Why is it that this pro province is unprepared in long-term care for this second wave? Minister of Long-Term Care once again to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question uh, to the member opposite. 99 per cent of our long-term care homes have no resident cases. We are working with the Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa to make sure that these homes are getting the care and support that they need. We are supplying and have supplied $243 million plus another $45 million for IPAC, for staffing, for assistance to our homes, and we will continue to work with our sector, whether it's the OLTCA, Advantage Ontario and other groups, because we do listen and we have been acting. We have been consistent in the message that the safety and the well-being of our residents and our staff in long-term care are our priority. And I feel that from the bottom Response. of my heart. And I tell you what, I will keep fighting for them. And if you want to inform yourself about what we're actually doing and listening, it would be wonderful. Once again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, seniors deserve so much better than this. They deserve so much better than this. You know, when the cameras were on, the Premier promised over and over and over again that the horrors that we saw in long-term care in the spring would never happen again. And yet here we are. A second wave is upon us, Speaker. Homes are once again in outbreak. Seniors are dying from COVID-19. Long-term care homes are saying clearly to the minister, whether she acknowledges it or not, that they are not ready for the second wave. The Premier has been talking about a detailed plan literally for months on end now. So why are families, operators, staff yet again left pleading for the, a plan from this government. Why has it come to this yet again? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. As you may know, uh, COVID is new to the world. The science is developing. We have learned a lot of lessons since the beginning, and we continue to act on those lessons. There is new information that is emerging, and you can see that with the, the confusion over the Center of Disease Control, or CDC, uh, the changing recommendations to the World Health Organization uh, about the type of spread this is. We are continuing to learn. And as we learn, we will be flexible, we will be adaptable, and we will continue to provide the proper surveillance. And it would definitely be helpful if we could have rapid tests uh, in our homes so that we could be screening staff as, as they enter. And that is something that the federal government could be helping with and uh, Health Canada. And so we know that there are many more things that could be done, and we will continue Response. to act as we learn more information. And I would uh, uh, appreciate the uh, opposition and the members of the opposition in Forming themselves. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. Health experts have been telling the government for months to prepare for the testing needs of a second wave. Yet we're falling short of testing targets, and lines are stretching around buildings for hours. And to quote Dr. Andre Picard, um, Ontario's messaging on testing and virtually everything else has been abysmal. Families have been left waiting for hours to get a COVID test done, and they desperately need the Ford government to improve their testing plan for the second wave. How will the Premier address this um, issue and release the long-delayed fall action plan to finally address the shortcomings in our system? Premier to reply. Through, through, through you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I just, you know, I can't believe what I'm hearing in the House. We're falling short on testing. We're leading the country, bar none, combined. Every single province in the entire country add up their numbers, don't even come close to ours. We're 38 percent of the population. We're doing 52 percent of the testing. We've done over 3.5 million tests, <laughs> ramping up to over 40,000 a day, getting up to 50,000. We aren't going to stop at 50,000. We're hammering the testing. We're making sure we have the community paramedics going out there, which, by the way, these, these folks are incredible, the community paramedics. They're doing great. 
had an opportunity to speak to a few of them. We have the hospitals increasing the hours to make sure they can handle the load. We have pharmacies coming on board right across the board, making sure that we take the burden off the public system Response. for the asymptomatic people. We have all hands on deck right now. Again, Mr. Speaker, where's the opposition been for six months hiding in a cave? That's where they've been. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the long waits and testing lines are now leading some entrepreneurs to offer private testing. A new service called Home COVID-19 Private Diagnostics says they're now offering private, mobile, and reliable access to PCR testing at home at $429 a test, Speaker. And uh, really, what does it say about the government's testing plan that people are actually ready and willing to avoid the lines and long waits to pay $429 taxes a test? Will the Premier be allowing people to pay their way to the front of the line to get a COVID test? Minister Hill. Well, I thank the member for the question. We certainly understand that there are some private operators out there that are proposing some of these tests, and we're examining this in the ministry to understand uh, whether that can continue or not. But what we're really focused on is increasing the volume of our tests. We, as the Premier indicated, we're already leading the country. Over three and a half million Ontarians have already been tested. We are aware that there have been some lineups in some areas, but we're acting quickly. We responded immediately. We have assessment centres that have expanded their hours. We have some pop-up centres that are opening up to take off some of the pressure from the assessment centres. We have the mobile testing units that are going in, and we're looking at expanding further into the community in other ways. So while there have been some lineups they are diminishing rapidly because of the uh, actions that we've taken proactively to reduce Spons. those lineups immediately. Okay. Question: The member for Oakville North, Burlington. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, this past Friday, you travelled to Ottawa to stand shoulder to shoulder with fellow premiers from across the country. You were there to advocate for priorities that are important to the people of Ontario and all Canadians. Health care funding is the key issue in the lead-up to the, Confederation, the Council Confederation meeting, and it is a critical issue that Ontario expects the federal government to address in its upcoming throne speech. Ontario is investing over $67 billion towards health care this year, but it's not enough to keep up with the growing health care needs. All the provinces and territories are making unprecedented investments in health care, but we need the federal government to provide more assistance. Speaker, can the Premier please share with the Legislature Question. more about our government's efforts to fight for equality when it comes to funding for health care in our province? The Premier. Well, thank, thank you very much. I want to thank the, the great member from Oakville, North Burlington. We had a, a great meeting, uh, Mr. Speaker, when we are in Ottawa. Again, a unified message from all parties right across the province. It doesn't matter if it's the NDP, Liberals or Conservatives. We're speaking from one voice when we're up there, and the voice is we need the Canadian health transfers to increase from an average of 20 to 22 percent up to 35 percent. Because, Mr. Speaker, as health is growing at a 6 percent rate, the federal government, and by the way, I want to emphasize this, it's not this federal government. It's this federal government, the last federal government, the last federal government. This has been going on for decades. At one time, Mr. Speaker, the split was 50-50. Now it's 78-22 or 80-20, one in every five dollars. Nothing moves. There's no Response. province in this entire country that can go it alone. We're asking for their support. They've been a great partner so far, but we need the support for the Canadian health care system. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Speaker, my supplementary question is to the Premier. Premier, those are critical areas of importance for my constituents of Oakville, North Burlington, and all Ontarians. But the federal government also needs to play a more active role on other health care fronts, like testing and enforcing quarantine measures. We need the federal government to expedite approvals for Made in Ontario rapid testing options. This means more testing at the borders, sharing data and information quickly, and making sure travellers are acting responsibly, especially now with the case numbers on the rise. But health care is not the only area of concern for my constituents and all Ontarians. Speaker, we need the Premier to continue his advocacy for further federal funding 
for infrastructure priorities like improved broadband Question. services and major transit projects to make life easier. Will he commit to doing so? And the Premier. Okay. Thank you so much to the, the, the member. Uh, that, that was another item. There was, there was three items, uh, infrastructure being one. Mr. Speaker, we put a record $144 billion into infrastructure over the, the next 10 years. And a couple of projects are our number one priority. For the people in Toronto and the GTA, it's the four subway lines, largest subway project in North America. It's absolutely critical. We partner up. And, and again, talking about a green initiative, that's the best green initiative, initiative we could do. And then for the rural folks, nothing, I can tell you, Nothing is more important than infrastructure. Broadband is critical. It changes people's lives. It changes the opportunity for kids uh, that, that need to go online for at-home uh, uh, learning. It's absolutely critical for businesses. I talk to business owners that have to drive into town to make a transaction. Response? We're going to make sure that we partner up with the federal government and make sure everyone in this province, as the federal government promised in the last election, that they have proper broad broadband. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Orangeville Banner is reporting on another striking case of ballooning classrooms. The Bellissimo family felt comfortable sending their young son to school because his class was set to be around 15 children. But just three days later, they found out that the class was collapsed with another one, doubling the size. But what's adding insult to injury, Mr. Speaker, is that when the family contacted their MPP, who happens to be the S Solicitor General of Ontario, staff in her office suggested the family consider private schooling. Speaker, through you to the Premier, is this the government's answer to the overcrowded classrooms we're hearing about across the province? Put your kids in private school. Wow. Minister of Education, reply. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government's answer is $1.4 billion of net new investment to keep every school safe in the province of Ontario. The, the assertion by the member opposite is categorically false. That was not shared nor communicated. What we are doing in every board in this province, urban rural, is providing our school boards with more funding to reduce classroom sizes. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing classroom sizes being reduced province-wide. In Toronto, we have over 366 more teachers being hired. In Peel, looking to hire over 60. In Dufferin Peel, Dufferin Peel in, the, in the region, the member opposite speaks about 29 more. In um, uh, Hamilton Wentworth, an additional 90 more educators in every school board, utilizing that $200 million provided by the province. Our aim is to ensure the layers of prevention are in place to ensure every school is as safe as Response. we can make it as we respond to COVID-19. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, the minister can try to spin this, but the truth is this government's failure to fund safer, smaller classrooms is absolutely undermining our public education system in this province. And it is making kids less safe. Just this morning, we now have 51 new cases in schools, 141 cases in 116 schools in this province. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We don't know how many cases there are in the private schools because they don't report it. How convenient. In fact, the Solicitor General and Conservative MPPs doubled down on crowded classrooms just last week when they voted unanimously to defeat our motion to cap class sizes at 15. And it is not just in Orangeville. A parent from Collingwood called me sorry, yesterday to share that in their school, and there's so many like this, four kindergarten classes of 20 had been collapsed into three classes of 20. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the minister stop trying to sell us a bill of goods and start taking action to ensure the safer, smaller classes? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Education, Mr. Well, thank you, School Board. Let's just uh, inform all members of what we're doing province-wide. The Toronto District School Board, in those high-risk communities, there's caps of 15 from kindergarten to grade three. From grade one to three, caps of 20, supported by provincial funding. From four to eight, caps of 20. In Durham District Order. School Board, uh, junior kindergarten to senior kindergarten, 21 average. One to three, 19 average. Grade four to eight, 23. Order. In Peel District School Board, junior kindergarten to senior kindergarten, 20.75 students. One to three, 18.9 students. Grade four to eight, 21.9. In each and every board, member for Davenport, come we to have order. provided funding to school boards to ensure that these classes are safe. We're doing everything we can, supported and endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province. 
The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. As we know, a report from the Financial Accountability Officer confirmed billions of dollars in funding from the federal government meant to support the province's back-to-school safety plan and to keep Ontarians safe from COVID-19 has been piling up and left unused. We, the milliards. Yes, billions of dollars given by the federal government are still not being used while the Premier of Ontario is boasting about all the money they've invested to help Ontarians. Seriously. Can you explain why he's hoarding a pile of cash from the federal government when that cash is meant to keep students and communities safe? Is it being kept to throw around ahead of a snap provincial election in the spring? Order. Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question, members opposite. Um, what I will say, Speaker, is the $380 million that the federal government provided the government in two installments, one in September 1, one in January 1. I would Order. inform the member opposite that the funding will flow in 2021 as per the agreement and as per the terms announced by the Prime Minister. It is his decision on when to flow it, although I agree and I'm pleased to hear that the member opposite stands with the government in calling for flexibility of those funds and expediting them based on the need in our schools now for additional funding. Speaker, it is this province that allocated the $381 million, the first tranche, on the day the funding was announced because we moved quickly knowing the risk and knowing the needs on the Grand. We'll continue to be there for our boards and advocate to the federal government to ensure the flexibility parents, students, and communities deserve. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier. Yesterday, teachers working for the Upper Canada District School Board learned that not only are they tasked with teaching students in their classes, but also live streaming to students at home while providing digital material to a third group of students and providing printed material to a fourth group of students. These students are all in the same classes, and the teachers are expected to do all of this at the same time. This was confirmed to teachers just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and they're expected expected to have plans in place by next Monday. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier explain how the government expects teachers to meet the diverse needs of their students while teaching using four different platforms? Minister of Education. Well, the Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for the question of the Upper Grand District School Board. We have provided, Speaker, an additional $50 million in COVID funding to respond, an additional 14 nurses, $1.5 million specifically to hire more educators. Uh, with respect to online learning, Speaker, we have set a high standard in this province because we believe education quality should be achieved in the class and online. And we are urging every member of this legislature to call on all of our partners in education to live up to that standard of excellence when it comes to online education. We didn't have that in the spring, respectfully. We also didn't have a unanimous voice in this legislature calling on that uh, outcome, which I think students deserve. 75% of online instruction, or instruction rather, will be done in a live Zoom-like experience. We've provided $36 million to hire principals for virtual schools. We've provided professional Response. development for every educator, and we will continue to expect the very best for all students in this province. Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for small business and red tape reduction. In Ontario, small businesses make up 98% of all businesses and account for a third of all private sector jobs. And I've talked to many small business owners, both Main Street businesses and supply chain employers, who have been most affected by the COVID-19, and they need help. We've also hosted a number of virtual meetings, and the message is always clear. They need help. Can the associate minister tell this house why he's doing uh, what he's doing to consult with small businesses and help them get ahead after months of COVID-related disruption? Thank you. Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tea Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glencairy, for that question. Um, you know, our government understands the importance and how essential small businesses are to our economy. And that's why, as soon as the pandemic began, we immediately began province-wide consultations with small businesses from all regions of the province. In the last few months, uh, caucus colleagues uh, and I have held close to 100 business, small business roundtables that you know, covered participants uh, from manufacturing agribusiness, professional service provider, providers, and non-for-profits, uh, and many more. And these roundtables have been a significant help in identifying challenges and barriers that currently exist. 
and also the reason we have been able to invest in small businesses, like programs, the largest single Bonds. investment in helping businesses go digital in a $57 million investment uh, in the Digital Main Street program. We're going to continue uh, to work with small businesses across the province and deliver the supports they need. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Small businesses that make up this province and make them work every day. From restaurants to mechanic shops to auto, auto sector parts, plants, and convenience stores. Small businesses are is a, not a sector but rather a horizontal cut of many sectors. So, can you please explain how you will ensure that all small businesses are part of our consultations and strategy as we move towards recovery? The Associate Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, small businesses make a big difference in our communities, but in times like this, COVID-19 has created new challenges for small business, and we recognize that. We know our small businesses face those challenges, and we're determined to hear directly from them, to listen to their concerns and help them achieve their long-term goal of success right here in Ontario. Our consultations have focused on helping businesses that have been affected most by the pandemic. For example, restaurants and retail industry. We have used our consultations to bring meaningful, meaningful change to regulation and processes. For example, in April, we introduced temporary regulations that allowed for bars and restaurants to include alcohol with their takeout delivery food items. We passed legislation to allow municipalities to Response. quickly pass temporary bylaws for the creation and extension of patios. We will continue to use regulatory modernization as a lever for economic support and activity. Well the next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Today, I will share the tragic story of baby Sophia from Newmarket. At the end of last year, Sophia's parents took her from Newmarket to sick kids after Sophia had been sick for 10 days. They waited seven hours in a crowded waiting room with a sick baby, only to be told that the wait would be at least six more hours. They decided to go home. The next day, they took Sophia to a local walk-in clinic. The doctor at the walk-in clinic sent them directly to the busy local hospital, and Sophia was sent back home. The mother said that the emergency department in their local hospital was so busy that the doctor didn't even have time to see their daughter. Tragically, three days later, little baby Sophia died. Speaker, the flu season, with the flu season around the corner, hallway medicine back into many hospitals, and a looming second wave of COVID, families are losing confidence in our healthcare system. What is the government doing to ensure that such a tragedy never happens again? In Ontario healthcare system. The Minister of Health. Well, I, I thank the member very much for raising this issue. And first, I'd like to express my condolences uh, to uh, Sophia's parents on the loss of their child. That is um, every parent's worst nightmare. So I'm very sad to hear about that. Um, but uh, you are right. We are facing significant capacity challenges in our hospitals right now as we prepare for the fall, as we prepare for a resurgence of COVID-19 uh, and the second wave. We are seeing numbers creep up. We are facing flu season. We want to ensure, of course, that we can also continue the surgeries and procedures in our hospitals that were delayed as a result of wave one. And I have had experience in speaking with parents as well as with the, um, uh, the, uh, the board at SickKids uh, as, as recently as yesterday to understand the significance this has specifically for parents with very uh, fragile, medically fragile children and Response. their uh, desire to not have any further surgeries postponed because it has a significant impact on their lives. I will have further information and supplementary. Much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. No family should be turned away from our public health care system during a crisis with a sick child. No parents should have to wait 13 hours to see a doctor at SickKids or any other hospital in their times of needs. The government needs to demonstrate to Sophia's family and to all families across Ontario that they take this crisis in health care seriously. 
Right now, it looks like the second wave of COVID will come at the same time as the flu season. So now, it is more important than ever that this government tackle hospital overcrowding and hallway health care. It is the minister's responsibility to prepare our entire health care system for the upcoming surge in demand. What is the minister doing to make sure that our health care system will be there for all Ontarians in need? Minister of Health. Well, I can certainly agree with you that every Ontarian, regardless of where they live, every Ontarian deserves timely access to excellent quality health care. And we know that our system has been very stressed as a result of COVID-19, but I can assure the member and all Ontarians that we have a comprehensive, integrated plan to deal with capacity issues and the other issues that a potential second wave of COVID-19 faces. That plan is going to be released starting today. We are going to discuss with Ontarians the plan that we have to deal with uh, continuing to follow public health measures to make sure that our hospitals have capacity, both with COVID-19 patients, with flu patients, and other patients who need care. We are working on making sure that we have the health human resources to be able to deal with that, and we want to make sure that we can continue with those surgeries Response. and procedures that are so important, because as much as we're dealing with a COVID pandemic, there are many other Ontarians with other health issues that deserve to be treated in a timely manner as well. We do have a plan. It will be presented starting today so that all Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. It's been more than three months since the Minister assured this House that cystic fibrosis patients in Ontario would soon have access to the drugs they need to enhance their quality and length of life. Since then, we've heard nothing more about negotiations between Vertex Pharmaceuticals and the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance on a purchasing price for Kaleidical and Orcambi. As the minister knows, Sasha and Jamie LaRock from Tottenham have two young sons suffering from cystic fibrosis. Both have returned to school this fall under very different circumstances. Ten-year-old Andre is part of a trial that provides him with a gene-modulating drug to treat his disease. Eight-year-old Joshua has no access to such drugs. He's attending classes far more vulnerable to COVID-19 than he needs to be. Speaker, why during a global pandemic does the government continue to withhold access to our Cambi, a drug that prevents lung infections? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for your continued uh, commitment to helping people with cystic fibrosis gain access to these new drugs. We certainly take the health concerns of voluntarians very seriously. Even during the pandemic, we are uh, we, we understand that people have other health needs besides COVID, and we know that people with cystic fibrosis are very hopeful that these new drugs are going to be able to live up to uh, the, uh, the promised commitments and, uh, and, and their needs to help them live a higher quality lives because they will be able to, uh, to, uh, to be improved on some of these new drugs. But we need to know and we need to remember that there is a process that we follow in Ontario for approving new drugs, and uh, we know that uh, we Response. have to take this evidence-based approach to make sure, first of all, that the drugs are going to work as they have been, as we've been told that they will. We need to know what the response will be with patients. We need to do the. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, speaker, this has gone on far too long. Twenty other countries have been providing or can be to their cystic fibrosis patients for years. The government has spared no expense to keep Ontarians safe from the COVID-19 respiratory virus, yet not enough has been done for cystic fibrosis patients who have a respiratory disease with a 100 per cent fatality rate. Given statements from the government about keeping our most vulnerable people safe and sparing no expense to protect our children, why don't we have a deal with Vertex? My constituents ask me often, is it the drug company digging in its heels? Is it Ottawa? Or is it the Ontario government itself? Can the minister explain to Joshua and other cystic fibrosis patients what the holdup is? And when will they get it done? Mr. Health. 
Well, I can assure the member that the discussions with Vertex and with Cystic Fibrosis Canada are still continuing, but we all have to remember that this isn't just sitting down with the uh, manufacturer with Vertex and negotiating a, a price commitment. There are many other aspects to this, and we also have uh, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance that is involved in these price discussions. And so even though Ontario is a party to those discussions, there are many other parties to these discussions as well. And so we can't predict a timeline for this to be concluded. I do ask for regular updates from my uh, the department in the Ministry of Health that deals with this. And while we all hoped that we would have had a response by now, we are continuing to follow it. We are continuing to have our involvement with it. We continue to press the alliance to please come to a conclusion soon with respect to these drugs because we know that people with cystic fibrosis are continuing to count on or can be and especially Turkafta as well Response. as another drug that has very promising improvements. So we will continue those discussions and uh, we will indicate to them that people across Ontario are waiting for a response as soon as possible. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you. My question is for the hardworking Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Speaker, many low-income seniors across our province have, for years, faced challenges accessing quality dental care. We know that there are major long-term health issues associated with not having access to this care. Could the Minister please inform the House on our government plans to help our low-income seniors. Mr. Responsible for Seniors. Good morning, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Aging Court for raising that important question. Our government's priority continues to be supporting the health and well-being of our seniors in our province. I also have heard from seniors across the province on how difficult it can be to find affordable dental care. I am proud our government has taken concrete action to ensure that our low-income seniors have access to the quality dental care they deserve. That's why we are investing $90 million annually through the Ontario Senior Dental Care Program. Our seniors have Response. built this beautiful province. Our government stands with our seniors. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Mr. Speaker, it is great to see our government taking action and assist assisting our seniors. Mr. Speaker, can the minister give the House some more information on how this program will benefit the Scarborough Aging Court and Ontario seniors in on this underserved and rural areas? Thank you. Minister. Thank you for the second question. Investing in our seniors will continue to be a priority for our government, Mr. Speaker. When fully implemented, our Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program will help 100,000 seniors a year. To help address underserved area, we are also investing $25 million this year in critical projects, adding eight mobile dental buses. Our Premier, our Premier made a promise in the last election to deliver this service for our seniors. Mr. Speaker, when we make a promise, we keep our promise. Thank Response. you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Women have disproportionately been impacted by COVID-19. And as he knows, in education, especially full-day kindergarten and elementary, educators and education workers are four times more likely to be women. That rings true in St. Paul's. Unfortunately for these women and their families, this government's plan for a second wave simply isn't working. The Conservative government's policy and implementation failures are hurting my families, hurting my schools and my community. Speaker, to the Premier, 
Our educators and education workers, again disproportionately women, are seeing our children and families through their toughest challenge during COVID-19. These frontline heroes are suffering behind the smiles that they're giving to our kids. Speaker, when will the Premier ensure every single school in Toronto St. Paul's has enough PPE, disinfectant, and every resource we need to keep every soul in our schools safe? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Education to reply. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, indeed, over 31 million pieces of PP was delivered from the Ministry of Government Consumer Services. We've worked very closely to ensure access to the supply chain so that all school boards, all schools, and all regions have the adequate supply they need. The next tranche for October is going on in real time, and a critical mass has already flowed. I've been working with Minister Thompson to ensure that continues to be done, ensuring that all the necessary materials are required are provided. With respect to how we're supporting parents, particularly moms, in the context of our recovery, we have put in place a very robust, comprehensive child care reopening protocol as of September 1, re-establishing capacity, giving parents more choice, and ensuring accessibility and affordability continues to be a key focus of this government. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, one of our staff members from Humewood Community School in St. Paul's has tested positive for COVID-19. I've heard from many staff and families. They are terribly, terribly scared, as I hope you can imagine. The risk of infection weighs heavy when our classrooms are still too large and some are either rationing PPE having to purchase it on their own speaker, don't have enough or frankly just don't have it at all. How can teachers like Rebecca ensure toys are properly disinfected in between each play experience without disinfectant? Speaker, to quote the nine-year-old kid I spoke with alongside his mom in Hillcrest Village, Miss Jill, why are we only allowed 10 people inside, my, inside our home, but my class is so much bigger? It's like I'm confused. Speaker, question. my question is to the Minister of Ed. Will you cap all class sizes today, all, to 15 children maximum without taking jobs away from one single ECE while you do it to keep our schools safe? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Education, respond. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, the government has provided uh, school boards with additional funding in the context of PPE. We've increased funding for cleaning. Additional 1,300 custodians are being hired province-wide. Uh, speaker, in the area of Toronto District School Board, just yesterday I facilitated a call with the COVID-19 command table with Dr. Dubay, the Associate Medical Officer of Toronto, as well as the directors and chairs of both public and Catholic and French school boards with a singular aim, which is to really work together, understand how we can further collaborate to minimize risk within our schools. What we are hearing, Speaker, is that our outbreak borders are working. Uh, obviously, we continue to work very closely with public health to minimize risk. We see continued increasing numbers in community of transmission. Uh, we're watching that with a plan, as the Minister of Health will unveil, to further reduce Order. risk province-wide and ultimately keep our kids safe within our schools. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Speaker, and thank you very much. Speaker, parents in my riding know how much this government cares about educating Toronto's two million students. They are the next generation, and they must be set up for success. Now more than ever, we need to invest in our children, and I'm proud that since our government was elected, each and every year we are investing more in education than ever before, with record investments for important initiatives. With COVID-19, we now face new challenges, and challenges that face our next generation. Can the Minister of Education please tell the Legislature how this government is setting students up for success while we battle this pandemic? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, Speaker, I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for her leadership and fighting very hard for the people of Toronto and for the next generation of our province, Speaker. You know, while we deal with this pandemic, and of course it is a, a human health priority for all members, I think for all governments, uh, in all societies around the world, we still have a responsibility to ensure quality learning within the classroom. Pedagogy matters, and quality and accessibility of that learning is fundamental. That's why we unveiled a math curriculum. We were not deterred from perhaps opposition members who want us to, to, want us to delay that implementation. We want to see the very best quality of math between grades one and eight as possible for the next generation. We codified financial literacy. 
now coding for every student from grade one and up. We worked with TVO and TFO to strengthen online learning capacities within our province. We unveiled an anti-racism, anti-discrimination plan. It's our first step in our plan to mandate training Fonts. of all teachers, mandate professional development of all trustees, and work closely with all school boards to ensure our boards, our schools, and our communities are more inclusive for all Ontarians. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. And Speaker, I'm very proud to be part of a government that puts the safety of students, families, and staff as paramount, back with record investments and a nation-leading plan. Although our minds may be drawn to COVID and its challenges, we cannot lose sight of the future and planning for the long term. I hear from parents in my riding that they want the best for their children, including modern schools and gyms, so their children can learn in a healthy and top-notch environment. And I know the minister, when he was in my riding and visiting uh, Bishop Allen Academy, he heard firsthand from our principals and vice principals. Can the minister please tell the legislature what our government is doing to plan for the future? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, and, and thank you to the member for the question. You know, Speaker, we are very aware, self-aware of the rather significant deferred maintenance backlog inherited when we came to office two years ago by the former government. There was massive school closures and a lack of funding to ensure that our facilities are maintained at a standard, a modern standard, that all students Order. in this province, I think, deserve, notwithstanding that there were 600 closed by the former government. Speaker, we have unveiled a 10-year plan, a $12 billion plan. We're investing 50, uh, 50 rather, we're investing $500 million on an annual basis to build over 30 new schools, to massively renovate 15, and to expand There's a conversation taking place at the north end of the chamber, and I'd ask you to cease so that I can hear the member from the floor. Minister of Education, please conclude your answer. Uh, $500 million, Speaker, as announced by this government on an annual basis, we're building 25,000 new, uh, new spaces of learning within our schools as a consequence of our investment. These are modern places of learning that we think all students of this province deserve. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. COVID-19 pandemic has been incredibly difficult for small business in Niagara and across Ontario. Recently, the impact of the government's unwillingness to help result in a business in Niagara Falls being forced to shut their doors permanently. With a sharp reduction in income and a full closure for several weeks, one local business owner couldn't keep up with rent payments. Their landlord, Alistair Kermack, and I'll repeat that, their landlord, Alison Kermack, refused to use the rent subsidy program and evicted them at the end of August. Frankly, this is unacceptable. Business is losing everything through no fault of their own. When will this Conservative government step up and provide direct relief for small businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19 and have had zero support from their landlords? The member for Willowdale. To respond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's no question that this pandemic has been hard on the hardworking uh, small businesses in this great province. And we have to remember that running a small business is hard, even at the best of times, let alone during a global pandemic. Certainly, this government has heard uh, the, the requests of small businesses and provided support uh, to the tune of $241 million for the Commercial Rent Relief Program. And the Premier announced that he has extended uh, the, the commercial ban on, on evictions in this great province, Mr. Speaker. We recognize, though, that there is more to be done, and that's why we continue to collaborate with our partners in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and we must remember that behind every single door of a small business in this province is a hardworking family trying to provide for their loved ones. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier, and I will respond to that. The reality is that if you have a rent program and you can't use it, it's absolutely no good to businesses if landlords won't participate. The business I'm speaking about has been operating for over 20 years and has employees for over 15. Businesses like these make up the fabric that make up our communities. I wrote to the Minister of Finance about this business, pleading for assistance. He chose to do nothing, no direct support, and a weaselly worded letter in response. The rent subsidy program provides 50 per cent for rent for businesses that have been forced to temporarily close because of COVID-19. But landlords have to apply, and some refuse to do this. I also talked to the Premier on this issue. My question is, why won't this Conservative government step up, provide rent support directly to businesses? 
Why are they sitting on their hands while business in Niagara and the rest of the province are forced to close permanently and lay off workers? Once again, Member for Willowdale and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, certainly the struggle of small businesses during this time of uncertainty and, and anxiety is felt by this government, Mr. Speaker, and that's why in March we announced uh, relief for individuals and businesses to the tune of $3.7 billion, Mr. Speaker. But we knew that wasn't enough, and the pandemic continued. And that's why we increased that amount to $11 billion, Mr. Speaker. We recognize, however, that businesses are still struggling out there. And that's why it is so important to collaborate with our partners in Ottawa to improve existing programs. And we will continue to fight for that. And as the member opposite knows, uh, the commercial rent relief program is administered through a federal agency in the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. But we will continue to work with our partners uh, in Ottawa to make sure that we fill the gaps that exist for small businesses, Mr. Speaker. And that is exactly what they expect in this great province. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Next question, the member from Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last week, we celebrated Military Family Appreciation Day. And I think I can speak for all members in the House in expressing our collective gratitude to the brave men and women who serve in Canada's armed forces and their families who support them on the home front. We honor the passion, commitment, and the sacrifice of Ontario's veterans and remember those who have given their lives to protect us. One of the ways we honor them, their memory and repay the debt we all owe our brave veterans is through the Soldiers' Aid Commission. Minister, can you share Question. with the House the role of the Soldiers' Aid Commission in supporting Ontario's veterans? Thank you. Minister, Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much uh, to the member for the question, and we're all grateful to Canada and Ontario's veterans for their commitment and sacrifice to our country. Our government has moved quickly on a number of fronts to show our support to our veterans, including eliminating property taxes at Royal Canadian Legions. Uh, we're building an Afghanistan memorial out in front of Queen's Park on the front lawn. Uh, we've given free fishing licenses to our, our veterans as well. And uh, we're also modernizing the Soldiers' Aid Commission, Mr. Speaker, which is the uh, legislation that we'll be debating here in the House this afternoon. The Soldiers' Aid Commission was created way back in 1915 as our men were returning home from the First World War, it was later expanded to veterans of the Second World War and uh, the Korean conflict as well. And since that time, our commission has supported veterans in Ontario with prosthetic devices Spons. and hearing aids and dentures and housing expenses. And we know that uh, certainly veterans are a federal mandate, but we're extremely proud in the government to be supporting our veterans here in Ontario. Speaker. And a supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I'm very pleased to hear that Ontario is playing its part in supporting veterans as they reintegrate into their communities and adjust to civilian life. However, Minister, Ontarians have served Canada's armed forces in countries around the world since the days of the Korean War. From Haiti to Afghanistan, soldiers have fought and died to protect Canada. Minister, can you update the House on what our government is doing to ensure the Soldiers' Aid Commission can continue its important work of providing direct support to veterans and their families? Minister Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you. And thanks again for the follow-up. It's, it's a sad reality, unfortunately, uh, that with each passing year, we lose veterans who served in the Second World War and the Korean War, Mr. Speaker. And while we'll never forget their bravery and their sacrifice, it is time that we honour a new generation of men and women who have served in the Canadian Armed Forces. That's why I was pleased on Military Family Appreciation Day last week in Aurora with the Minister of Health, our Deputy Premier, and uh, our great member, uh, Mr. Parsa, uh, to celebrate the expanded Soldiers' Aid Commission. If passed, our legislation is going to ensure that the reach of the Soldiers' Aid Commission is expanded to all. Ontario veterans, no matter where and when they served. And the Premier and our government Response. are going to stand behind each and every man and woman who served in our armed forces. And a modernized and expanded Soldiers' Aid Commission is our province's way of saying to all our Ontario veterans, 
Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. The next question, the member of St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday was the first day that Niagara saw the reopening of the YMCA after-school daycare centres. Since they got the province, provincial's reopening plan in the middle of August, they felt they could not make their own plan to open safely or fast enough. Elizabeth Speck is, uh, is a frontline worker in our local hospital. She is a constituent of mine who could not find childcare for the duration of COVID-19. Like many women, she had to choose between her job and childcare. This is her first week back to work because after-school childcare is now, is now available. Most Question. of the concerns I see coming into my office about childcare have come from women like Elizabeth, women worried about being set back or losing their jobs. Family needs support, and women need just recovery. Will this government commit today to being transparent with the parents of this province about what kind of support they will be receiving to ensure women like Elizabeth are not forced to abandon their income and their careers as a result of poor planning and lack of available childcare spaces as we go into possibly the second wave? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, we kept childcare open for emergency workers. Uh, we did that decisively because we recognized our frontline heroes needed support. And that's why we kept childcare spaces open with very strict health and safety protocols, systematically with the guidance of public health and the chief medical officer of health. We increased it based on the risk profile, moving to cohorts of 10 to 15, and now as of September 1, re-establishing pre-COVID capacity. We've provided financial support for parents directly. Uh, earlier on in the pandemic, we have ensured that our operators, our childcare spaces, centers, have the funding they need for PP. Uh, as well as for operating support. We've seen the majority, the vast majority of childcare uh, operators reopen in this province and will continue, knowing that we just announced the federal government a one-year extension of the Canada-Ontario uh, Canada Early Childhood Agreement. That provides an additional infusion of $200 billion more dollars to the sector to backstop them and ensure they're sustainable for years to come, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.